This video is sponsored by PCBWay. More on them later. Hey, what do you all think of my new look? Isn't it awesome? Also, I finally exchanged my stupid point source studio light for a proper light strip, which shouldn't cast as many shadows and hopefully does away with those blown out bright spots that take so much time to fix in editing. Anyway, today we're here to build something I already know won't work, as well as something I hope will work for my $50 wooden 3D printer project. What are these things and why do I bother to make something if I know it won't work? Well, the one that doesn't work will be the X carriage. As we established in episode 5, these cheap unipolar stepper motors I'm using don't work with micro-stepping, rendering my wonderful 90s tech fishing line direct drive useless because we don't get enough resolution. It's actually slightly worse on the x-axis, cause my gear reduction here is only 4.16661, to 1, and even though that's mostly made up for by the much smaller diameter of the drive drum, this very drive drum is also the problem. And in case you didn't guess, the problem here is the problem itself. The drive drum doesn't exist. This motor gear assembly is the second stepper I pulled out of the electronic typewriter I took apart for this project, and it used to spin the daisy wheel. As a result, the only thing I have to work with, unless I want to build my own gear reduction, which I certainly don't, is this little groove here. However, if I wrap the fishing line around it twice, it's basically packed, which means the fishing line won't be able to wander back and forth in it like it does on the y-axis drive drum, and I'm pretty sure this will result in axis creep over the duration of the print. But Benjamin, I hear you ask, why do you go ahead making the X-Carriage use a linear drive mechanism you already know won't work, rather than simply installing lead screws straight away? Well, simply because I think it's faster for now. When I'm ready to set up the software on this thing, I fully expect to have to run it back and forth like a thousand different times in between changing various settings like I had to do with my pen plotter, so if every homing cycle takes 5 minutes and I need to do like a dozen of them in a row, that adds up to a lot of waiting. Plus, I really like to push the limits of what I can get away with and still have a 3D printer that more or less works. So let's quickly build another version of Chronic Carrier Spring around this sheet metal gear assembly in a quick montage and stick the hot end on it. Then we can move on to the more interesting bits.
As usual, I blatantly overestimated just how much I could possibly get done in a 60 second montage. But isn't Cat awesome? Look at these clearances right out of the gate. Unfortunately, this design was just a little too professional for my own good. Usually, having all the moving parts tucked away out of harm's reach of whatever could get into the gears and such would be a desirable engineering choice. However, considering I do this for a video and have to film everything, hiding all the interesting mechanics behind the sheet metal was kind of a bonehead move. Either way, there was no point in explaining every single step, since, as you just saw, the entire X-Carriage design is highly customized to fit this very specific sheet metal assembly from that typewriter. When we get to converting both axes to lead screws, the X-Carriage will be much simpler. Basically, just a plywood rectangle with a chronic carriage spring on the back. And because then, the X-axis stepper motor will be attached to the axis directly, and not to the carriage, which incidentally is also the reason why I only stuck these end caps on with double sided tape instead of screwing them on, because I want to drill these mounting holes when I actually need them and not have to retrofit something onto existing holes. But as I was saying, when this motor is stationary on the axis and not moving with the carriage, it'll also free up a lot of space and weight on the carriage itself, so it actually makes sense to install a direct drive extruder on it. Heck, the carriage is so big, I could probably fit one on there right now, but for now I only have this standard Bowden tube planned. So let's install my cheap hot end and try it out. I mean, try out the carriage, not the hot end. I already upgraded this hot end to use four appropriate pan hat screws to attach the fan instead of the two inappropriate countersunk ones. It's really a shame we nowadays need to finish the products we buy ourselves just because the manufacturers can't be bothered. I also installed a 1mm nozzle on it because with a 0.2mm overall resolution that'll probably be necessary to not have area print fail. As usual, the code I'm using here to test it with a potentiometer will be in the description. And yeah, it seems to work just fine. Of course, it makes a terrible noise at certain speeds with the lead screw rattling around here, but if I could get it printing at these speeds as much as possible with hard accelerations to get over that noisy stage as quickly as possible, I think it would actually not be too bad. Certainly quite fast. I mean, this is normal 3D printer speed. Although, like I said, I would be very surprised if it doesn't start to creep away from the intended position after a while of running back and forth like that. And if that happens, I'll be sure to explain why. This is Brian, a 22-year-old wannabe electrical engineer. He's just stayed up past 4am putting together his newest circuit on a piece of stripboard to try it out, blissfully unaware of the fact that his computer was right next to him. Had he just uploaded the build file to PCBWay's website and picked a few preferences, he could have had a complete prototyping board made and shipped to him within a few days, all while catching enough sleep to not be extremely tired to classes next day. He could have even significantly shrunk the size of his circuit board by taking advantage of PCBWay's reduced pricing on multi-layer boards with 4 to 6 layers, making it actually fit the enclosure he'd envisioned putting it into. Huge thank you to PCBWay for sponsoring this video and supporting tiny channels like mine. Now, what about the other, more interesting thing we wanted to do in this video? The printer is nearing completion at a rapid pace now, but one of the things still left to do is the heated bed. If you watched episode 0, where I introduced this project, you might remember my plan of using the glass pane from the scanner unit of an inkjet printer I took apart as a build surface. And while most heated beds usually have an aluminum layer somewhere between the heating element and the build surface to evenly spread the heat, I just don't happen to have any large enough aluminum sheet laying around. And buying one would have exceeded my tight $50 budget. So, you guessed it, we're gonna do without one. I figured as long as I use a lot of heater wire to cover the entire surface evenly with a pitch of less than a quarter inch and without leaving any big gaps, the thermal conductivity of the glass alone should hopefully be enough. 
And if it turns out that's not true, I still have some big enough pieces of generic steel sheet which I'll use as a backup plan. Although I really don't want to deal with a conductive metal plate in close proximity to the heating element. Not using a metal plate raises another issue though, because the aluminum is usually also the structural backbone of the heated bed, while the glass surface is only clamped on top with some binder clips. If I get rid of the aluminum altogether, the glass suddenly becomes its own and the only structural part of the heated bed, which means I now need to figure out how to mount bed leveling screws on a pane of glass. And the way I solved that in my CAD model was by adding another four manufacturing nightmares. The bed leveling screws are riveted into bent sheet metal corner clips that clamp onto the corners of the glass. And I really don't want to make these. I am really tempted to just drill holes straight through the glass and stick in screws like you would put in screws normally. I have access to these carbide drill bits used for tiles and they work on glass as well. It would be very high risk because if I break just one of the corners, the entire pane of glass would be shot. However, the prospect of having to make some elaborate metal thingy to clamp on from the outside makes just sticking in the screws really rewarding. Screw it, I have one more glass pane with the exact same dimensions. Let's try it. If I break it, we'll try something different for this one. I'm using the Dremel tool with the diamond tip to do the equivalent of sander punching. You could probably do the entire drilling with the diamond insert, but it'll take ages and probably dull at least one bit in the process. And then, with the pane of glass sandwiched between two pieces of sacrificial material so you can't see when it breaks, we're off with the drill. Now, it's worth noting that these drill bits are generally used with coolant, but I'm running it dry. I did some tests beforehand, one with oil, one with isopropyl alcohol, but running it dry always came out as the winner because somehow the oil ended up lubricating the drill, which made it stop drilling almost entirely. I think that's because glass is denser than tiles, so it uses the powder of the already crushed glass as an abrasive to crush more glass if that makes sense. In that case, cooling it with scouring cream might be a good idea. But I won't try it on this one since I just want some successful holds and why fix it if it ain't broke? Also very important with these drill bits is not to apply too much pressure. I'm mostly just relying on the weight of the cordless drill itself, which depending on your drill might be ample. In my case, I'm pushing just a little extra until I hear the drill bit engage with the material. Although it would be safest to not apply any pressure whatsoever, I don't want this to take forever either. Great. I think I'm all the way through, and the moment of truth. Yep, that is a hole I can put a screw in. Although it did break more than I'm willing to admit out the other side. Now I just need to do the exact same thing three more times without screwing up. Wish me luck. A little longer than a few minutes later. Well, that went south faster than I'd hoped. Just kidding. I actually did it. Here we have four holes drilled and the glass is still intact. And to prove that I didn't just cheat and use the second pane of glass after breaking the first one, here's the other one with identical dimensions. I went a lot faster and more aggressive on these other three holes and with exception of the last one, ironically, they all turned out better than the first one. Presumably the fact of not also having to look good on camera helped me concentrate better on what I was doing with the drill. Either way, I now have four holes in the glass plate for bed leveling screws, and because it would be a bad idea to tighten metal screws directly on glass, imagine those gut-wrenching crunchy noises, I made a bunch of cardboard washers to go between the metal and glass. Yes, I am fully aware that putting cardboard on something designed to get hot is a bad idea, but keep in mind we're making an entire 3D printer out of wood, which inherently poses an undeniable fire hazard in the first place, so maybe we shouldn't worry about those washers too much. 
After all, they are mostly sandwiched between non-flammable materials, and the odd 120 degrees Celsius the bed will see in normal use are reasonably below the ignition temperature of cardboard. As a convenient source of springs, I recommend these sort of, but not really single-use soap dispenser pumps. I was actually gonna use these, but now I find they're a little long for my liking, so rather than crop them, I found some more appropriate shorter ones in my collection. And until I get this printer printing, I'm going to use bog standard nuts to adjust the print bed, because making these nice red shiny varnished knobs out of wood is extremely cumbersome and takes literally ages. This looks way too modern and non-DIY for this printer, though it still wiggles around quite easily on the Y carriage. Maybe my springs aren't stiff enough? Anyway, last but most importantly, we need to figure out how to get this glass plate heated up to 120 degrees Celsius without spending a single dollar. That actually proves quite difficult, because at 330... Okay, future Benjamin here. What I was about to explain and try for the heated bed is not going to work for several reasons. Turns out, it's extremely difficult to make a heated bed this size for under 10 bucks, which, after adding up the spreadsheet, seems to be about what I've left of my budget. So, unfortunately, I need to completely redesign the bed heater, and since this video is not only more than long enough already, but I'm also running out of time to get it out by the end of the month, We'll have to call it a day here and dedicate an entire episode to the heated bed. I wanted to make up for those bad news by at least demonstrating all axes running simultaneously, but you wouldn't believe it, I literally just wasted two entire days just trying to get the code for that to work without success. So I'm afraid you'll have to live without that demonstration. Next episode we're going to build the extruder while I figure out how to make a really cheap heated bed off camera. So stay tuned for that. The extruder will make use of something unique that, at least to my knowledge, has never been done before on the internet. Also, huge shout out and thank you to my first patron! I won't pronounce names lest I might butcher them, but if anyone else wants to help make this channel sustainable and more independent from advertising and algorithms dictating the content I put out, the link is in the description. All Patreon members get access to videos as soon as I'm done editing, and sometimes, as in the case of this very video, that turns out to be a Patreon-exclusive ad-free version. Hope you enjoyed! Please don't be expecting two videos from me in May. I still need to do my taxes. See you next time. Bye-bye!